Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started with just the intro, and uh, feel free to get refreshments and relax. I'm Bertha L. Archie, a registered nurse, the president and CEO of Nursing Care Professionals, and I'm also the president of the KMMNBNA National Black Nurses Association. It's a local organization that have it has members in the West Michigan regional area, and I'm the co-chair of this particular particular event along with uh, Lodi Wartzenstein who is unable to be with us today. So I will be serving as your moderator. Again, welcome to this, the Michigan Works Friday Forum series, a series sponsored by the Work Retention Network um, and the efforts of the committee, the Work Retention Network Committee. And let me just share with you who the committee members are. First of all, I want to acknowledge uh, General Chairperson of the Board of Directors of the Workforce Development Board, of which I am a board member, uh, as well as uh, some of the other members that are in the audience. Um, the other members are Dave Parker, who is the chair of the Work Retention Network Committee, um, yours truly, Dan Baron, Goodwill Industry, Dan Black, Allegan County Commissioner. He's here if you stand. Be acknowledged. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dan Wegiv, Allen County Transportation. Uh, Deb Vandermolen, Kent Regional Foreseen. Um, Deb, you're here. Where are you? If you'd stand and be acknowledged, okay. And those that are here with this part of the committee, please stand if I've, uh, if I've called your name and not, and you have not had the opportunity to stand. Linda Joy Vasquez, Disability Associates. And I've already mentioned that Lodi is not able to be with us today. Um, I would also like to acknowledge our executive director, Ms. Bev Drake, our associate director, Ms. Sylvia Hobson, and certainly our wonderful, wonderful staff and other professionals that are with the Michigan Works. Ms. Maureen Downer, Ms. Christy Graham, these are people who really work daily to make sure this forum goes forward and we really appreciate that and all of the others that have helped us. We're delighted to have such a distinguished featured speaker this morning who will assist us with an overview of uh, cultural awareness and health care in the workplace which is the topic of discussion this morning. Um, she will take about 20 minutes and give her opinion <clears throat> excuse me, her opinions as well as her expertise. She is with uh, Spectrum Health. She is the, as you can see from the literature that went out, she is the Spectrum Health Diversity Officer. Okay? And she will be accompanied by four other panelists that will come up and assemble after our featured speaker has presented. Each one of the um, panelists are, and I just will quickly go through those, individuals' names at this time, and they may share additional information when they are speaking. Mercedes Tuhay, she's the president and CEO, Language of Cultural Institute. Uh, Ms. Ingrid Scott Weekly, the director of Equal Opportunity Employment, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Michael Reagan, the president of ProAction Behavioral Health Alliance. And finally, Bama Karens, deputy city manager, finance director, of Wayland, Michigan. I am very, very pleased to acknowledge this distinguished group of expertise that will present to us today. It is, I can hardly wait to hear what they all have to say. It's just wonderful. And so as we uh, proceed on, do you know the do's and don'ts about your employees' respective ethnic group? If you do not, you're in the right place and you're at the right forum to learn key information about various ethnic groups, including work values, workplace values, and healthcare beliefs. I would just like to do a, a little bit of housekeeping before we proceed to have our featured speaker come up. Bathrooms are out the door to your right, your immediate right, and there are also water faucets. Um, the additional format will be after 
our featured speaker has spoken five minutes presentation from each of our panelists and then we will adjourn into question and answers if you have questions I'd like for you to assemble stage left this is the mic that you will ask your questions from this particular series is being recorded it will be shown on GRTV so feel free to speak up and come to the mic we will be covering those that have questions without further ado it is truly a distinct pleasure to bring up one of our outstanding leaders in the community, none other than the Miss Joyce Henry. Good morning, and thank you, Berthel. You know, it's really interesting when Berthel comes to call, she often gives you limited information, and then at the last minute, she delights and surprises you. And for me, that was in the information that this was going to be recorded late <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> so I was not necessarily prepared for that. Um, as she said, my name is Joyce Henry, and I, am, um, I have the honor and privilege of leading the diversity and inclusion inclusion strategies for Spectrum Health Grand Rapids. Um, I, it's early in the morning and I like to kind of get folks started. Let me turn this other mic on so I can move a little bit so you can hear me. So I'd like to get started really with an early morning exercise to get you kind of moving a little bit as we begin to talk about this cultural piece and as it applies to our workforce and certainly in the healthcare area. Let me start with this gesture. Can, and I want you to just tell me what you think this means. A-OK. -okay. 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 Anybody differ? A okay? Zero? Some cultures threat? Let's try another one. Thumbs up. All right. <laughs> All right. What else can it mean? Way to go. Way to go. Yes. yes. Hitchhike. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fingers crossed. Okay? Hope. For some people, it may mean protection, friendship, a swear. I swear. What about this one? For those that are of my generation from Carol Burnett's age, Hello. the touching of the ear. Hello. Hello. Anything else? Good. Can't hear you. In some cut can't hear. In some cultures. This, that person's an informer, disbelief. What about this one, lastly? Kind of the nodding of the head. Agreement. Agreement. What else could that mean? In my culture, it's an acknowledgement when I pass people on the street. What else? Permission. Permission. I could say it could be directional. Go that way. Go that way. Wanted to kind of wake you up this morning to help you understand that we're all in this together. And when we start talking about things as simple as gestures, we are talking about culture and cultural competence. I'll try here. My charge today was really to talk about cultural awareness and kind of why it, is it a business imperative and kind of what your role is. And really when I start beginning, because I don't talk a lot about cultural awareness anymore because you know that cultural awareness is really the education piece, the things you can read in the book, the textbooks. And I really want to move from that awareness to what you do with that information. It's the diversity one-on-one -on -one classes. And so what do you do? with that information once you learn it. Increasingly, our towns, counties, and cities are developing into multi-ethnic and multicultural communities. It's the result of a stream of immigrants which, which really started about 35 years ago and they've been continued to come in the country. The numbers really speak for themselves. 
every year in the U.S. Um, we invite in, we admit in about a million plus immigrants. Another one to two million people come to stay here illegally every year. As a result, an enormous shift in the American population has taken place, which is affecting every aspect of our lives. Neighborhoods are changing, and so are our schools, medical facilities, and places of work. Already, one in five people today are speaking a language other than English in their homes. In our schools, K-12, some 40 to 45 percent of all students come from cultures that differ from that of their teachers. And in our care facilities, our health care facilities across the nation, 35 to 40 percent, and it's changing every day, of all patients differ culturally from their caregivers. Unlike in education, where it is the, stu it is the student's I'm sorry. <laughs> Unlike in education, where is the students that increasingly come from a large diversity of cultures, in our health care facilities, this development is a two-way street. Not only do patients increasingly come from a large variety of cultures, physicians do as well. Physicians are, are uh, increasingly foreign-born and foreign-trained. Among nurses across the nation, close to one-third of them are from Asian backgrounds. It's not the numbers per se, however, that constitute the greatest challenge. It is the enormous diversity among those large numbers. In the past, the vast majority of immigrants came from one or two major cultural areas in the, in the world. Until about 1965 from Europe, and after that from Mexico and other com countries. Today, however, people come from every major and minor culture area in the world. Some 40% are arriving from Asia, however, um, from Asia alone, with its vast plethora of cultures and religions. The American population today consists of some 170 different ethnic cultural groups. Each of these groups is characterized by its own particular cultural code. That's the key term that I kind of want to leave you with today. Cultural code. A set of values and assumptions, notions and beliefs that shape the way people act and think, relate and communicate, what they consider is right or wrong, good or bad, important or unimportant. It's this cultural code, therefore, that shapes the way people interpret their illness, the way they respond to pain, relate to caregivers, see the role of family in caregiving, perceive the ideal body image, consider the meaning of food, the expectations of what bedside manners are, etc. Effective care giving as well as the managing of this multicultural hospital um, environment to a large extent depends on our understanding of these different cultural codes theirs and ours, and how they shape people's perspectives, their behaviors, their ideas, the way they react. The idea is really to achieve cultural competence or cross-cultural competence. It's only achieved when caregivers and or managers, and I'd say the entire workforce, in a multicultural workplace are able to use people's cultural codes in the process of caregiving and in the management of our work teams. Brought some sample definitions, and I did bring some handouts that I'll, I'll hand out to you. Kind of just to look at how at Spectrum Health we define diversity. You know, it's defined as all of the ways in which people are different it affects how people see the world, how they behave, 
and what values they hold. And then I gave you a definition of this cultural code, the set of values and assumptions, notion and beliefs that shape the way people from diverse cultures act and think, so on and so forth. I also wanted to talk a little bit about what I mean when I use this word cultural competence. Um, we had a work team at the hospital that was working to define a definition or to develop def a de definition for our environment. And we really looked at definitions from across the nation and landed on 50 plus. And so that team of caregivers and, um, and administrators worked, and this is where we landed for Spectrum Health. A set of knowledge, uh, beliefs, and attitudes manifested in behaviors and skills that enable staff and the organization to respond effectively in cross-cultural interactions. And really the work of that is to be able to take that and then use it in whatever environmental setting you're in, in the healthcare, in the clinical area, in the non-clinical areas, in human resources, in our supplier and construction area, in absolutely every area. What does that mean? How do we interact with each other and those, those that we provide care with and those that we receive service from? In my intro, I talked a little bit about the business case and really I just kind of wanted to bring that down to some real salient points. The reason we talk about this, the cultural awareness piece of this, is that as healthcare providers, we are responsible for responding to the current and projected demographic changes in the United States. We are accountable for eliminating long-standing disparities in the health status of people of diverse racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds. We have a responsibility to improve the quality of services and outcomes in our care environments. We are responsible for meeting our legislative, regulatory, and accreditation mandates. And, you know, I have to say from a personal note, for um, many of the years that I've been doing this work, it's been out of my passion. I think many of us, as I look around the room, we started this work with uh, the Institutes for Healing Racism and, and our need and our interest in, in providing equity. But when we look at the healthcare environment, Increasingly, on a daily basis, there are regulatory mandates that we have to comply with. You know, years ago, it was the introduction of the class standards. And now we're looking forward as Joint Commission put some real teeth into our responsibilities and obligations as health care uh, providers. Obviously, to gain a competitive edge in the marketplace, you know, if we're looking at um, the Grand Rapids area as destination healthcare, how are we going to get there? What are we going to put in place? Um, some additional kind of demographics. I didn't go back, did I? No. Uh, racial and ethnic minorities make up 30% of the American population. That figure is expected to increase to 40% by 2030. Some 47 million U.S. residents or 18% of the population speak a language other than English at home. I find that interesting when, we, when I look at the workforce from the hiring, recruitment and retention perspective. You know, we're working with the, um, the Center for Literacy here in the Grand Rapids area to empower our staff especially those in those entry level positions so that they can be successful and grow with the organizations, either our organization or others. I wanted to talk a little bit, just in case you think, okay, what's it's really about? You know, some of the things when we start talking about cultures, I wanted to kind of list some of the things that um, we encounter in a healthcare environment as it relates to the healthcare. So, and you know, if you look at the first one, the evil eye. How many of you heard of that and that kind of evil eye? It's, a, a, it's perceived to be a spell put on another person to cause them to become ill, often done because of some envy 
Um, some actions neutralize. Um, a belief that's held by many different cultures. Um, witchcraft, voodoo, or the hex. All of these can be used for both good and evil. A spell or curse or hex is placed on a person. This may be re removed by someone believed to have stronger powers. And remember, as I share this with you, I'm not going into detail. It's kind of a broad overview of kind of what the common belief. Astrology. How many of us, how many of us read our horoscope at night? And does it drive or change, or do we just kind of use it as a reference point when we think of the things that happen to us? Many cultures believe it is important to consult lunar charts to determine the appropriate timing for important things, marriages, those business dealings, death, even um, health care procedures. Unlucky numbers. This is a big one. Number 13, remember, I mean anything to anybody in the room? You know, for some of us, it may be unlucky. From a Navajo perspective, it's positive. So that's kind of the opposite. And, you know, Chinese regard the number eight as wealth, and nine as long life. Hot and cold diseases. Um, object intrusion. You know, a magical object is believed to have entered the body, treatment, uh, you know, uh, for a person. And then how does that impact the perspective of the healthcare environment? Just some high level things to consider when we're talking about healthcare in this work em environment um, perspective. Two important things when we look at that. And I'm looking at, I'm watching the clock. Um, treatment must be appropriate to the cause, and our understanding of the illness must not get in the way of our attempting to understand the belief of other cultures. All medical systems are based on the relationship of what is seen as cause and effect. And so we have to look at that from our patients' and families' perspectives. And this also plays out in the non-clinical arenas when we look at our diverse work teams and we look at perceptions of, of time and priority and family in terms of how people interact on those diverse work teams. Um, there is a perspective of cultural sources of misunderstanding. This plays out in both the clinical and non-clinical arena. Degrees of directness. How a person who, who speaks um, can perceive this perhaps passive or aggressive. Or if you look at it from a gender basis, a female that may be looked at more masculine if that person is direct and more strategic. Um, appropriate subjects for conversation. What can we talk about in that environment? What can we talk with, about with our patients? Facial expressions and eye contact. Many, many years ago, I encountered a person in an elevator who was one of our environmental services person. You know, I grew up in a culture where you speak to everybody. And so I acknowledged this person as I entered the elevator. And the person turned around to say to me that I had was one of the first individuals to actually acknowledge them in a friendly way, being concerned about how they were feeling and really cared about that day. And so that was important to them. Touch, loudness, and pitch. You know, people that are animated, talk with their hands, and those that are not. These are all sources that can add value to a team or can cause conflict to a team or in that patient-provider interaction. I wanted to look at this a little bit since we're primarily healthcare providers. The perceptions of pain. You know, not all social or cultural groups respond to pain in exactly the same way. Some are very stoic, stoic. Some are very vocal. Some really wail. You know, as a result of of pain. How people perceive, experience, and respond to pain is influenced by their so, their social and cultural backgrounds. Um, whether and how people communicate their pain to health professionals and others is also influenced by social and cultural factors. Pain relievers are often seen as incomplete and unsatisfying treatment when you think about that pain perspective. 
So I really want to, you know, kind of end this by talking a little bit about your role. You know, when we think about, you know, what are the, some of the things that we can do to be effective? Um, really, um, I always say take an honest look at your personal biases. We all have them. And that's really, you know, kind of a start as we look at this. When we, you know, generally when organizations start beginning looking at diversity and inclusion and what can they do, you know, they're very often they will say, mm, that happened here. We're open. Everybody's able to contribute to our success and our mission. There are no challenges or obstacles. And so this is really, you know, take an honest look at your personal or your organizational biases that may impede uh, quality health care for um, our patients and families. Do assessment, an assessment of both your positive and negative assumptions that you carry and that play out in the work environment. As individuals, learn to ask questions in a culturally sensitive manner. Not from your perspective, but from the perspective of the person you're interacting with and have the ability to reevaluate each individual as they undergo change. You know, this is this process is really a journey and oftentimes we make snap judgments about individuals and as they grow and they develop and they have epiphanies, we have to begin to be able to go back and reassess the contributions that that person's making. Also provided some recommended behaviors for the healthcare arena. And, you know, I'm looking at the time and <laughs> kind of watching Birth Thou. I won't, you know, I really, you know, in the healthcare environment, I learn to interview and assess patients in the target or via appropriate use of bilingual, bicultural interpreters and translators. Asking questions to increase your understanding of the patient's culture as it relates to the healthcare practice. You know, where do you hurt? What brought you here? You know, versus from our perspective, where appropriate, formulate treatment plans which take into account cultural beliefs and practices. Write instructions or use handouts if available. Request the patient repeat back information provided by the healthcare professional to ensure understanding of the message. Clearly commun communicate your expectations. Speak slower, not louder. <laughs> when appropriate, use drawings and gestures to aid in, aid in that communication. Make no assumption about education level or professionalism. When I look at our 14,000 work, um, workers in our work environment, many of the individuals that we have in some of our entry-level positions are new to this country and come with multi-graduate level degrees. Um, avoid using fit phrases such as you people, which may be culturally insensitive. And so I'll kind of go on from there. I want to leave you with this little, this is not my model. It's one that we use as part of our universal competencies at the hospital. As part of the, all of the things that each staff person must complete, there is a diversity component of our universal competencies. And one of this is the crash model. And we really use this to improve awareness and sensitivity to the cultural perspectives of our patients, families, communities, and each other. Cultural competence is a thread that is woven into everything we do at the organization and every person is, is being held accountable for their contribution to it. So, you know, looking at the letters, it's a little acronym that will help you remember it. C, consider culture when you're interacting with patients, family, community, and each other. R, respect other people's cultures and learn how, to res how respect is communicated within those cultures. Assess and affirm, affirm culture, including positive feedback about the person's culture. Sensitivity to the other person's culture, the impact of one's own culture is key. And humility is needed. Cultural humility. You know, I've been doing this work for 10 plus years. There is not a day that I don't learn something different, something new. It might, meet, might not be something that is immediately usable. I tuck it away 
until there's a time to need it, use it. Cultural humility causes me when I am um, looking at new projects to assess who's not at the table, whose voice is not being heard. Can we look at this differently? Because we've been doing it this way for years does not necessarily mean there's not a more creative and innovative way to look at things. So this is a little you know, acronym that can be used in um, both the clinical settings and the non-clinical settings. I'm going to leave you with this thought. Cultural competence begins with an honest desire not to allow biases to keep us from treating every individual with respect. It requires an honest assessment of our positive and negative assumptions about others, and that's not easy. No one wants to admit they suffer from cultural ignorance, or in the worst case, harbor negative stereotypes and prejudices. It is important to remember that diversity exists in every group of humans. In addition, people change through acculturation and assimilation. We also must avoid jumping to conclusions. We have to evaluate each person using a number of cultural clues. Remember that cultural code. And when in doubt, learn to ask questions in a culturally sensitive fashion. Learning to evaluate our own level of cultural competence must be an ongoing part of our effort to provide each individual and family with superior quality personal care. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. you did so well. May we give her another round of applause? Thank you very much. Ms. Joyce Henry for that wonderful overview. I learned something. You know, every time I participate in these cultural diversity, healthcare awareness uh, workshops, forums, I always learn a lot. And we do have personal biases and other things, and we could all be more sensitive. So and she, she gave us a lot. I won't even begin to try to reiterate it. It is my pleasure to bring up the panel to join Joyce, and we will start with uh, Mercedes Tuhay being the first position beside Joyce and Ingrid, Miss Ingrid Scott Weekly, uh, the second Lee and uh, Mr. Mike Reagan, thirdly, and uh, Miss uh, Bama. Uh, she can pronounce her last name more accurate than accurately than I. And so, if they would, if we would proceed on, each one, Miss Tuhay will have five minutes to respond to. Um, questions that she has prepared for you, and each one of the panelists will proceed down the line with. Without further ado, Ms. Tuhey. Welcome. My name is Mercedes Tui, and I'm delighted to be here. First of all, delighted to be in such wonderful company. I'm Hispanic from South America, and uh, the one thing that we have to realize is that uh, amongst the Hispanics, there are 20 different cultures. So when you're dealing with them, uh, you're not only dealing with one little group of people. You're dealing, dealing with 20 different cultures. The people from the Caribbean have a tendency to be more exuberant, uh, louder. You know, you get a group of uh, 10 Cubans, 5 Puerto Ricans, and 6 Dominicans, and you have a party no matter where you're at. <laughs> and people say they're arguing. They're not arguing. They're just talking. Okay. Some of us from South America are a little bit more quiet people from Mexico and Central America. So we differ in the way we speak, on the way we behave, but you know there is one thing that goes across the board, and, and this is something that we as Hispanics <coughs> accepted all along, is when someone comes in to you, you get up, you extend your hand, you don't have to kiss, we like to kiss, <laughs> but in this case, you extend your hand and say, welcome. Mm -hmm. We're so happy you're here. Put a smile on your face, and from then on, you're going to feel that you have welcomed that person in, and then from, you can move you know, to more serious discussion. Another thing, another problem that I have seen in, in, in relating to people who go out there and do not speak the language and have a translator, someone from Voices from Health, for instance, that is translating out there. and the doctors and nurses have a tendency to look at the translator, you know. So there is the lady who's really sick, who's in pain, 
and the doctor or the nurse they're talking to the to the translator the translator then talks to the person but in the meantime this lady doesn't know what's going on and uh, a lot of our doctors don't use body language they just sit there and they said you know your arm is broken and we're going to have to operate you're going to have to go in the hospital and, and no emotion because that's what they're trained to do well if he doesn't talk to the person and just talks to this other one the sick person already is sick feels left out so you know the equation is all wrong so let's let's make sure that when you're speaking to a person don't speak to the translator they're being paid there to translate they know that and they're doing their job efficiently but always welcome and talk to the other one something else that uh, is uh, that happens amongst us and this happened to me when I was in, in the hospital I was being treated I, I crashed my car and I heard in the you know next door that this guy was going to fell off a, a tree ladder the, they were picking fruit and the ladder broke he fell down broke his elbow where they were telling him he had to take his underpants down this this woman nurse was telling her you need to get, put this rope take your underpants down and this guy was saying why would I take my underpants if you're going to operate on my elbow <laughs> you know and, and there was just no comprehension there the woman says you're in the hospital and you know when the voices started raising I just put a little cover on my eye and went next door and I said look let me explain that please okay mm -hmm. and that was before we had the wonderful translators we have I said you have to go in and they ask you to put this because they're going to you know medicate you and, and so it went a whole I mean I went on for about 50 minutes sometimes what you say in English in four words by the time we get done translating we spoke about 15 to 18 words and you're saying is she really saying what I'm saying? We are. But we're softening the blow in many cases, making sure they understand because we're also dealing with different levels of comprehension, education, and social levels. So, you know, if you get a wonderful translator out there who uses 50 cent words and you're speaking to someone with a first grade education, isn't doing anybody any good because by the time they get done the doctor gets done the translator gets done the person says okay because that's what they're trained to say okay mm -hmm. they leave and they have no idea what happened because you know the way it's being done so we have to realize where they're at and you know their level of education so we can in turn make sure that we tell them what is going on and what the process is going to be. We, uh, in, in the Hispanic culture, we, lo we believe that the doctors and the nurses, their words are God's word. We believe in what you tell us because we've been trained to believe that you know what you're doing. We don't doubt you because in Latin America we don't have lawsuits against the doctors. We don't have all this, you know. They made a mistake. Okay, they made a mistake. So, but, you know, we want to make sure too that we understand where they're coming from. I had a lady who had fallen down while at work and I got a phone call and she says, don't worry, you know, because I was going to take her to, she says, no, 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 I'm just going to take her to this woman who rubs. I said, rubs? What do you mean rubs? And she says, oh no, she's a rubber. Okay, I said, a rubber. Okay, let me go. Don't move. I was in there. And there is this lady, when you fall down, she puts some ointments on you and rubs your hands. But I said, no, no, no. If you do that, you know, we don't take her to an emergency room and make sure that she's treated. The company is not going to pay for anything because you took her to a non-authorized um, healthcare worker because they, that's what they are and, and therefore you know you're not going to get anything so I, I put her in the car against the grumblings of the husband and the son-in-law and everybody else and she ended up with a cast can you imagine if that broken arm if they would have rubbed that broken arm mm -hmm. what would have happened but we truly believe in that kind of medicine you know the little teas that we have when you go to a Mexican store, you find all these little teas 
And believe me, some of them work very well. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, um, uh, blossoms, uh, the orange blossom trees. That's what the Indian women all over Latin America drink before they give birth. It's a muscle relaxer and really helps with the pain. So we believe in that kind of, uh, of you know, teas and herbs because we were raised with that. Now, it, it is true that we don't expect you to understand everything, but at the same time, a smile, a greeting, and talking to the person, and do use your hands to express yourself. That makes you more accessible, you know. Body language, I know we cannot teach our doctors that, and um, bless their heart, some of them try very hard. But our nurses are wonderful, and, and they, they really grasp and they really learn. And I can't say enough about, about all the other healthcare workers and social workers who are there to help everyone out. My five minutes are. Berthel is looking at me. That's <laughs> <laughs> that was really interesting. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is Ingrid Scott Weekly, and uh, I work for the City of Grand Rapids as the Equal Opportunity Director. And I am thrilled that uh, we are having this forum today where these issues uh, can be discussed. I think that um, uh, cultural uh, diversity, cultural competence, cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity is so important. I, I think we first have to become aware, and you all, by virtue of being here, probably mm -hmm. have gone a long ways toward becoming aware of the differences um, that people come to the work with particularly as they relate to culture but in addition to the awareness does come the cultural competence and I think that's in part what we're trying to do today um, Joyce gave you a definition of cultural competence you know your ability to hear from not only Joyce but all of us as we try to provide you with information and context about the various uh, groups of people that you work with um, or who present themselves to uh, your um, provider for health services. So that's very, very important. It allows us to develop policies and procedures. And then, of course, uh, the cultural sensitivity. Once you become culturally aware and you've developed the competence, then you have the tools and the sensitivity to deal more effectively and to maximize success and um, minimize the potential for conflict and discord in your organization. So I, I'm really thrilled to, to be a part of this and to um, take a few moments to share some of my thoughts with you. Um, with regard to African Americans, um, as I thought about what I wanted you to take away from the day, one of the important, more important things that I think uh, you should remember is the historical context in which African Americans came to this country. We didn't come to this country voluntarily. We didn't come to this country seeking religious freedom or economic opportunity or better way of life. We were ripped from our homeland and brought to this country in very substandard um, conditions to really fulfill an economic purpose. And as you know, uh, African Americans constitutionally were not considered human beings. We were considered property, um, three-fifths of a man. Not only um, with regard to the Constitution is this true, but we've seen it reiterated over and over and over. I would dare say that we are probably the only race or cultural group in this country who uh, has a whole system of government with laws traditionally that were written uh, to continue to relegate us to second-class status. Uh, early on Supreme Court decisions, um, Dred Scott decision, which reaffirmed the notion that African Americans were um, property and not people. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal facilities were okay, going to the extent that when people applied to law school or grad school or med school, rather than have them sitting in the classroom, um, having them sit outside in the alcove or in a chair or away from the others, reiterating this notion that somehow to even have African Americans in the same classroom somehow um, was uh, just unthinkable um, because of their status as, as second class citizens. So we, uh, as a group of people, have this sorry history and this context 
that we have to deal with it. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, here we go again. That same old argument about slavery and, you know, when are they going to get over it? It's a new day. My God, we've got an African-American president. So things really are changing. Things really are, you know, looking up and getting better. And to some extent that is true, but I would argue and submit to you that the vestiges of slavery, the vestiges excuse me, the vestiges of Jim Crow still manifest themselves today. When you look at the disparities that exist um, between African Americans, for example, and whites, um, they're mind-boggling, whether it's health care uh, disparities, uh, you know, the difference in infant mortality rates right here in Grand Rapids, whether it's looking at net worth, and you see that when you look at the data, you see that uh, African Americans as a group tend not to even have a nest egg compared to a substantial next nest egg for their white con counterparts, whether it's employment or education or the extent to which we're adversely impacted by diseases or job discrimination. Um, you know, the research is just replete with data that continues to show this disparity. So it is important to look at this in a historical context because the impact of what happened then then continues today. And it has, in fact, impacted African Americans, I think, a great deal. So much so that when we present to the workplace, we do so with distrust. Um, and we do so with the assumption, often, that we're not going to be treated uh, in a positive way, that we're not going to be respected or acknowledged or validated. We, 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 we present, I think, with those kinds of expectations, unfortunately, but it's a direct result of what uh, historically we experienced as a people and what people continue to experience today. You know, I think of the city of Grand Rapids and this whole notion of a cool city uh, and how great it is and all the economic development and growth and everything that's happening downtown, but when you talk to African Americans and even young African Americans, yuppies, young urban professionals, um, they questioned this notion of it being a cool city because of the challenges that they felt that they faced as African Americans. And I would dare say also that you who are not African Americans, who are in the workplaces, who do make the hiring decisions, who do uh, interact with the patients, you also come with your own set of assumptions and your own set of beliefs as I think Joyce illustrated so beautifully early. So you've got African Americans on the one hand presenting with some distrust, some notion that I'm not going to be validated, that I'm not going to be treated fairly, and then there you are uh, with your own set of assumptions and beliefs. Um, and we all have them. We're all ethnocentric, whether we want to admit to it or not. We all have um, feelings and ideas and notions about other groups, even though we uh, attempt to overcome them. But I think you know where I'm going with this, that, that when we present with each other, we do present in a way that probably doesn't facilitate you know, mutual respect and good relationships and providing the best services that you can, recognizing the strengths and the opportunities to um, uh, work with people, promote people, listen to people, or even treat people. And I even think... Um, uh, about this whole notion that in the in the healthcare industry in in particular, study came out a couple of years ago, Berthel, I believe that suggested that um, when doctors were treating patients of color, that they didn't always um, provide them with a number of healthcare options. Uh, and you know, you know, when my husband and I go to the doctor and we come back and we talk, we we notice things like this, or we wonder with suspicion whether or not we were given all of the options that we needed to be given in order to make good decisions. So I think there's room um, for great growth in this area. I think um, that for African Americans, we do want to be treated with dignity and respect. I cannot tell you how often uh, when I'm talking to people, people who may be indigent and um, getting social services and on um, uh, Medicaid, who say that they don't feel that they were respected. You know, they've gone to the doctor and it's, oh, it's one of you people. You know, you're you're getting public assist assistance, so somehow you're uh, less than a first-class citizen and I'm going to treat you accordingly. Um, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority uh, conducted a study um, oh, about a decade ago now on uh, African American in Kent County. And one of the things that that study looked at was the extent to which um, United Way service providers uh, provided services with 
consideration of the special needs presented by African American women. And we looked at uh, a number of United Way agencies, including those that provided um, health-related services. And the response overwhelmingly that women gave was that they felt that people were disrespectful, sometimes bordering on, on rudeness or a very insensitive or detached uh, from them. So I think this is a real issue that we have to be aware of and that we have to uh, deal with. And my final comment would be, you know, we've all grown up with the golden rule, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Sounds like a wonderful golden rule. That's the way I was raised. And um, But I think that when we look at that through a diversity lens, we see that part of the assumption there is that um, everyone wants to be treated like we want to be treated. And I don't think that that's correct. So maybe we need to look at the golden rule not from the standpoint of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, but do unto others as they would want you to do. You know, just really kind of flipping uh, that paradigm. And uh, I thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Good morning. My name is uh, Michael Reagan. And uh, I work at uh, ProAction Behavioral Health Alliance. And as I've listened to Joyce and uh, my two colleagues, <laughs> Ingrid and, and Mercedes, uh, Birthdale, I was trying to figure out, well, what's Mike doing up here? He is a white male, so I could go from that tact, okay. from the dominant uh, culture that, that has permeated our history as a fine nation. I could uh, come on uh, to... Uh, as someone who is 65, so that puts me in a generation that might be different. <laughs> I could come in as the chief executive of an organization that needs to be committed to all the things Joyce said about how does cultural competence and sensitivity permeate everything that we do. Everything. It's not just a face we put on at certain times when certain people present. It is something that permeates the culture of the organization, its values, its policy, its decor, its how it dresses, how it does everything. So I can't say it better. Uh, so as a chief executive, and this is true of every healthcare organization and every employing organization, cultural diversity has to be something that is promoted from the very top of the organization, including those who own us namely our boards, and that our boards themselves must reflect the communities in which we are responsible to serve. So we have to pay attention that there is a complexity and diversity across all the things that make us different as a community beyond just race and ethnicity, which are critically important, gender, geography, uh, age, even some of the professional cultures that from time to time need to permeate who we are. So I, I could come on uh, as basically a chief executive saying that these are the things that are important as organizations to have cultural sensitivity and competence. I, you know, the other thing I could talk to you about is I'm in the world of behavioral health care. And how many people in this fine nation of ours suffer from mental illness and substance use disorders? And are they different? Well, for many of them, there's this thing that over the years we call stigma that has attached to their particular disorders that really identify their disorders as, well, it's really different. It's really not like diabetes. It's really not like hypertension. It's really not like asthma. It's really not like cancer. Uh, this is something mysterious, and we don't always understand it. Uh, it could be a moral issue. And very often, we've been afraid of it as a society, and all of our societies. And when we're afraid of something, what do we do with it? We want to keep it away from us. So we segregate those who have mental illness and or substance use for the rest of us. Sometimes we used to put them in institutions. We called 
asylums. And then we attach this really attractive word, insane asylums. Sometimes we don't know what to do with them, and we just say it's a legal problem. So we put them in these institutions that we now call prisons or jails to keep them away from us. And we call these prisons correction systems when they're really penal systems. They punish people. They do it well. So I could come at you from that, that we've got to pay attention to how we as employing organizations are sensitive to the reality that the prevalence of substance use and disorders and mental illness is going to show up among the people that we work with. It's going to show up in the people who present for employment with us. And what do we do about those who manifest the symptoms of these disorders after we've hired them? Well, there are answers to all of these things. It means that to be sensitive to that disorder means I need a safe and effective workforce, but I can respond to these disorders by simply, not simply, but by a commitment that we're going to have an employee assistance program that basically recognizes that from time to time, people can have a whole lot of different things going on in their life that affect their ability to perform on the job. And in this very stressful environment that we're living in right now because of the economic depression that we are now in, it can manifest itself in a lot of ways as that family faces the insecurity of one or other of the spouses having lost his or her job. And it manifests itself in a whole lot of situational stress that is real, that we've got to be sensitive to. So I want to plant those seeds, that there are things that we can do to be sensitive and responsive to this disorder while we're maintaining a safe and effective workplace. As a provider of health care, I can come on from that perspective. And one of the things that I have to make sure that manifests itself, and my predecessors here have said it well, and we've got to make sure that as people come to us, we welcome them. Sounds simple, doesn't it? It's not. It is a learned behavior like every other behavior. We need to welcome them. And I think my predecessors have said it well, and I'm sure my colleague here from Whaling will say it too. We need to listen to them. Why are they here? Don't assume that we know why they present themselves to us. So one of the authors that I was reading around cultural competence says, you know, I can't know everything there is to know about the Mexican culture or the Dominican culture or the, the culture of Colombia. But I can learn a whole lot from those who are from those cultures as they present. And that means I have to listen to them and that I need to respond to what presents as they present it. I think Birthdale just walked up here to tell me I'm close to my five minutes. <laughs> so I haven't lost my eyesight as I turn 65. But uh, So I think those are things that are important from my perspective that to sort of cut across a lot of the differences that present uh, as well as those that are clearly represented in race and ethnicity and our attention in this nation to the color and pallor of people's complexion and skin. Thank you very much. Last five minutes we need for Ms. Bama, if she would have her five minutes. We only have just an hour. And what I'd like to ask you to do, we'll close it after Ms. Bama and have you stay just a few minutes afterwards for Q&A, okay? Because it is being televised and the hour will be as a real hour. Thank you. Ms. Bama? Thank you for giving me the opportunity. My name is Bama Kerens, and uh, I come from an island called Sri Lanka, which is uh, an island south of India. Um, long time ago, like thousands of years ago, we, have, we actually m immigrated, uh, migrated from India to these islands, and which is now called Sri Lanka. Diversity, is, the concept is not new. It's uh, we kind of think that it is 
uh, new just for the 20th and the 21st century. But it is an old concept. Some um, in the 14th and 15th century, people from different cultures and different disciplines, um, like architects, scientists, um, uh, um, philosophers, theologians, all of them came to Fr uh, Florence, Italy, and exchanged ideas and um, <coughs> explored new uh, um, new ideas. And out of it came the, the Renaissance era. I think um, in the same way, we all could contribute to the betterment of humankind in medicine and in various other fields. Coming back to my culture, uh, we are called the South Asians. Our, the way our, uh, the way we conduct our family unit, it is uh, indeed a family unit. It is not unusual for three generations to live under the same roof. As a result, the individual individuality is not emphasized upon, but what is emphasized is what is good for the family. And then when you are out on your own, whatever you do is supposed to reflect back on the family. So that's why education is important to us because we as a family can be economically strong. Our social behavior is important. Um, so, and there's also a lot of family <coughs> input. Although at the time I grew up, I considered that as a, as a uh, detriment in the sense I couldn't do what I wanted because I'm always answerable to my mother and my grandmother and her mother. So, uh, but after coming here, I see the pros and cons. The, another aspect of um, the Sri Lankan or even Indian cultures is uh, to do with the, the uh, male, the male, males and the elderly are usually the spokespeople for the family. I think uh, Ms. Joyce talked about eye contact. In our culture, it is not appropriate to make direct eye contact. Uh, in fact, I, I was uh, married to an American, and he thought some of my relatives looked were shifty-eyed, and he wanted to know what they were hiding. <laughs> um, another another um, way our people express their affection is um, it's not unusual for same-sex people, the members from the same sex, to hold hands or to hug. Um, that's a sign of friendship. And uh, it is inappropriate in a public place for a, the members of opposite sex to embrace or hold hands. The, um, another um, way our people react is uh, when you ask them a question, they are reluctant to give you a yes or no answer. That come, they think that is a little too forward or it, it, they, are, they want to spare the other person's feelings, especially if it's a no answer. So they may either not answer or smile nervously. And so I think when as healthcare professionals, when you ask, they may just smile. It doesn't mean they are they understand what you are asking them, but they are re reluctant as to how to answer that. I think, this is just my own perception, is since we have been always moving with this in enormous family unit, we really don't have the confidence to say, is this where I want to be, or is this what the treatment I want? Uh, moving to healthcare, it's not unusual. It, it, in this country, or uh, in the Western world as a whole, a doctor usually comes into a room or a nurse and directly speaks to the patient. In fact, it's it's one-on-one -on -one basis. He tell, gives them the diagnosis and they discuss about the, uh, I mean, they give them yeah, the diagnosis and discuss the uh, treatment. Um, also, the privacy is protected. You don't want everybody knowing about your illness. But that's not true with the Asian culture. You will have a whole family unit showing up to the doctor's office 
and the patient is usually quiet while the people around them want to find out what's wrong, uh, how could we go about uh, treating this patient. And the reason is after the person, I mean, it is, it's the family unit takes over. They are the ones who uh, usually discuss um, who is going to do the, the taking care of the patient, who is going to cook the meals, who is going to um, drive the person back and forth from hospital and back. So it's, it's, a, it's a family affair. I, I, that's why I want you all to keep in mind that um, the, the, uh, give you a little insight into our culture that, uh, that they, it is the family play, plays a bigger role than now we like to admit to ourselves. Thank you so much. Wow. What an outstanding group you have been. Don't we have, have a reassemble an outstanding group of experts? to offer congratulations and appreciation and remarks to what well, you did such a great job. So we really appreciate it, appreciate our featured speaker, Ms. Joyce Henry, Spectrum Health Diversity Diversity Officer, giving us this large overview and she did an outstanding job. <laughs> and uh, Mercedes Tui, you were outstanding equally as well. And I have a lot of questions I'd like to ask you and certainly uh, Ms. Ingrid Scott Weekly, who uh, spoke on African American culture and gave us an outstanding history. And Mike, I thought you were going to say you're the only male, also. That's diversity. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Here I am surrounded by beauty and. Uh, That's exactly from ProAction Behavioral Health Alliance and uh, Ms. Palma. The uh, Deputy Finance Officer from Wayland, you all have been simply outstanding, and I thank you immensely. I would ask you not to leave. At this time, let us open the floor for Q&A. So those of you that have questions, would you hastily come to this mic and begin to ask your <coughs> questions, please? <laughs> and you will, those that are asking questions will also be included in the presentation. Yes, <laughs> yes. Good morning. Good morning. My question is, often I ask it, act as a personal advocate for patients, and one thing I notice on occasion is what you spoke to is that clinical detachment or those non-verbal, those non-verbals of detachment, and sometimes it makes the patients extremely anxious, and oftentimes they ask me not to deal with it because they're fearful of sanctions that if I say I want another caregiver or I disrespect. The, the doctor by challenging them based on how they interact with the patient. They say, no, please don't because when you leave, I have to deal with them afterwards. So I'm looking for a strategy on how to reassure the patient as well as how to deal with that healthcare professional that perhaps is a little rougher or, you know, physically when they handle the patient and doesn't have those um, receptive nonverbals with patients of different culture, different ages, and different experiences. Okay, um, I, I think the best way in this case is to be very honest, very open, and let the patient know, you know, I am here as the intermediary person, and you know the doctor here has explained this, and, and just soften. I, I think you can do so much by just making whatever the, the doctor has said, if you make it very nice, you, you can change the language and say the same thing and make the patient feel comfortable. I don't know if I'm answering your question though, uh, because you said later on you have to, you're, you're there start to deal with the professional end of it and, and the patient is left. Well, how do I would approach the healthcare professional also? Because I can sometimes soften it to the patient, but approaching the healthcare professional, they may or may not be able to be released from the care of that person but it impacts the healing process for the patient if they're constantly on guard or uncomfortable with that particular caregiver, whether it be a nurse or a doctor. How as an advocate could I approach the professionals to bring their attention to this issue? You know, from my perspective, I, I wonder if you could in a reactive mode. 
and I wonder if, it, if there's a way it could be addressed in a more proactive way. I mean, once the situation has unfolded, it is very, very difficult. It would be difficult and awkward to sort of change directions at that point. And so perhaps your focus and your energies uh, would better be spent in working through and with your organization and, and the people in it to address the issue up front to prevent it from getting uh, to that point. Um, that would be my, my thought. Um, um, I don't know to what extent, for example, uh, a, a, a nurse or a physician would be appreciative in the middle of things of your coming and, and, and trying to gently, you know, redirect them in a more culturally sensitive way. So to deal with it proactively may be one option for you to consider. I'd like to add to um, Ingrid's response. Um, I think reactive is short term and it's effective. I think on a longer term it's more proactive and so it's really working if I look at the curriculums that are currently in place in medical schools, when I look at the curriculum content, at least at our organization and our orientations, we are really including modules that help our providers better understand how to navigate you know, those integration, uh, interactions with patients and family. In fact, recently in, in December, we just launched an entire cultural competence required curriculum to all of our staff, which includes our employed physicians. And who would, would you be the contact person if an incident happened with a patient that you had a concern with? Would your area be the area to respond to, or would there be a different chain of command, Again, so to speak? Again, as I said earlier, everyone in the organization has appropriate accountability depending on what the, where they are. And so I share that with the nurse educators and the clinicians and individuals in our, our exceptional experience area as well. Okay, thank you. Great. We have probably just a couple of more minutes. I'm going to ask, ask each panelist to take just one minute and share one thing that they want us to take away with with us. They have shared so very much. For example, Ms. Obama might say, you know, be sensitive to the fact that, you know, Asians have these concerns about not looking you directly in the eye and don't judge them on that. So just go down the line and share with us one thing that you think. Um, let's start with our featured speaker, uh, Joyce. My one, my one thing is there is increasingly more literature about how to deal with diverse cultures. Um, I brought with me a book, Health Matters, that kind of gives you some lists. These are checkoff lists. Mm -hmm. And what we encourage individuals in our organization to do is this is awareness information. At the end of the day, treat every patient, family, and staff person as an individual. Very good. Uh, to cap it off on uh, what I have said before, there is a universal language and something you can take every place with you. And that is that smile in your face, that God-given smile mm. and a handshake and be pleasant and welcoming. We all have that within us. Just use it. Put it to good use and believe me, the results will be great. Um, great. And I would agree with that. You know, as, as much as I, I'd like to think that you know, I am completely culturally competent. Obviously, I'm not. And you may be feeling somewhat overwhelmed. Gosh, you know, depends on the culture. There are so many groups within cultures. What? How can I possibly, you know, become culturally competent and make sure that I'm being sensitive to individuals and supportive? And I think, you know, in addition to acquiring the skills and prevailing upon your organization to provide the curriculum and to have accountability and to make it a requirement, I think the bottom line is exactly what Mercedes said. And that is that in the absence of really knowing how to uh, address a situation or, you know, doubting yourself about whether or not you would have the skill in any given situation, to just uh, have that human touch and that empathy and that humility just goes a long ways toward making that person feel comfortable, welcomed, valued, and respected. Very good. <laughs> Let me echo what my colleagues just said. I, I think it's an ongoing learning experience that we learn sometimes from the mistakes we make uh, because that helps us as organizations be less reactive if we are open to say and be humble but this is an ongoing commitment to me personally as well as, and we have to model that so that the rest of our colleagues who we work with also know that we continue to learn and to appreciate 
how diverse we really are within subcultures as well as the dominant cultures that we might experience. I heard this from another Sri Lankan friend. She said, kindness is something the blind can see and the deaf can hear. I also would, um, one of the ways uh, you could deal with my culture, Indians and Southeast Indians, um, is to explain to them, um, give them a reason. Because their philosophy has been um, there for thousands of years. By just telling them, they might not comprehend or they don't want to change. So give them a reason. Do this because this is good for you uh, or give them a, another alternative um, reason. So I leave you with that uh, concept. Excellent. They have really said it all. We all have personal biases, and we all have the responsibility to work on doing better. Is that what you have all shared with us at the final conclusion? I want to thank you so very much. And for those of you that have come to this forum, we thank you. You got up early and you came out, and we know that you had to plan for this, and we thank you very much. The committee had the responsibility to bring someone with them, and I want the committee to know that my guest today is Ms. R.G. Holloman of Time to Talk, Ms. R.G. Holloman Shabuzu, so I thank you very much, would you stand, for coming with me, as well as some of the committee members have brought others. Thank you very much again for this. I, I really appreciate all that you shared this morning. And would you commit to come back again if we should ask you to? <laughs> well, thank you very much. And with that, we will close and we will have certificates for you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. As always, good to see you.